Hello and welcome to the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone, Biotone Edu Partner Program and Massage Industry Experts. With the challenges that have faced massage schools, students and practicing therapists, thanks to COVID, the EduTalk series supports virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise on topics, not only for class discussion, but career success. Tonight's experts are James Weslowski and Dr. Carrie D'Ambrosia. Dr. Carrie is president and director of D'Ambrosio Institute and certified instructor with AHI, the International Alliance of Healthcare Educators. He's author of the textbook, Positional Release Therapy, and numerous industry articles. Additionally, Carrie's a doctor of oriental medicine, a physical therapist, and an osteopath. James Wislowski is an international lecturer, educator, and author of Clinical Massage Therapy, a Structural Approach to Pain Management. He's also published numerous articles, manuals, and DVD series. He's a MCB TMB approved provider, a certified personal trainer with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, and a weekend warrior seminar instructor with the Center for Pain Management. He was inducted into the Massage Therapy Hall of Fame in 2008 and recognized in 2012 as Teacher of the Year with the Canadian Massage Conference and 2015 at the World Massage Festival. We've got an excellent EduTalk lined up for you tonight. So let's listen and learn as James and Dr. Carey share their assessment and treatment strategies on clinical reasoning approaches for knee lesions. Dr. Carey will discuss his total body approach while James will discuss his local approach. Both approaches provide insight into how to most effectively assess and treat client knee pain and dysfunction and build your practice through knowledge. Thank you for joining us. Again, please be sure to have your sound muted and video off. We invite you to submit chat questions that will be answered at the end of both presentations. So at the end of the evening, we'll answer the chat questions. So with that, I'm turning it over to Dr. Carey. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And Carey will be followed by James. Here we go. All right, you got me uh, highlighted there? You're highlighted. I see your name. All right. So guys, welcome to this. I think as a student, I would really like to watch something this myself. I mean, I've known James for several years and he brings a wealth of knowledge uh, in the musculoskeletal realm. What I hope to bring uh, to this talk is looking at the total body perspective. We've taught together a few times and I, and I think we're in mutual agreement that all therapies work and that we have to kind of work together. And it's the evaluation that's going to dictate sort of what we're going to do with our patients. So when we were asked to do this, James and I had a talk and we decided that we would use, you know, just the knee as an example, a case study could be anything, could be the back, could be the shoulder, could be the neck, it doesn't really matter. But what we're gonna to do tonight is just kind of show you a different uh, perspective of total body versus a local treatment. And our goal with this is uh, sort of to help you guys make better decisions with your uh, with your patients. All right, let me click this and away we go. All right. So here it is, clinical reasoning. Our goal is to help you make better decisions. And we're looking at the total body versus the local approach. Now, you should have this handout. And so everything is in the handout and um, there's page numbers there that will kind of follow my slides. And you should have these two handouts as well. This is 30 years in the making. This is how I make my decisions through this DAI treatment approach chart. Now, in planning this, we have about a half an hour each, and we'll use a case study of a knee, is 
I want to focus on on a couple of questions that we all face as as practitioners. So we have a patient, you know, coming in with a knee problem. You know, how are we going to decide sort of where to treat and what to treat? And so I'm going to take the side of a total body, and then James will take the side of sort of a local treatment, and we'll kind of put it all together. So as we're talking about this, if you have questions, put them in the chat, and at the end we'll address all these questions. So <clears throat> here we have two people. They both have knee pain and knee, probably dysfunction. You know, they, they may have limited range of motion. They may have weakness. So they have uh, le knee lesions, we would call that as well, dysfunctions. So when they come into your office, these patients are going to want you to treat their knee because that's where they're feeling their symptoms. Their doctors are going to want you to treat their knee if uh, if it was worker's comp or the insurance, the insurance company wants you to treat their knee. But is it the best place to treat? you know, is, can we make better decisions with this? So one of the questions that I like to ask is, well, how does a knee heal? Well, in order for that knee to heal, it needs blood supply. So there's blood supply from the heart going towards that knee, bringing oxygen and nutrition. In order for that knee to utilize that, it's got to get rid of the waste products. So we need proper venous return and lymphatic return. And there's an old saying in osteopathy that drainage precedes supply. So we need this. We also need energy flow. I'm a doctor of oriental medicine as well. We need energy uh, supply. We also need nerve supply. And these are all called vital substances. Okay. Now, we can have different types of barriers. We can have local barriers. And local barriers can be sort of a disruption locally in this circulation that we're talking about, this inflow, this outflow, and also nerve and energy flow. So local barriers could be uh, protective muscle spasm, could be fascial tension, could be joint hypermobility, right? Could be energetic imbalances, right? Could be swelling, could be emotions, could be any of those things. And James is going to kind of focus on that aspect um, this evening. The other barrier that we could have is more of a total body barrier. So when you talk about all these vital structures locally in the knee, you also have to think about, well, how did they get there? There's a pathway. There's a pathway from the heart all the way to the knee and from the knee back to the heart. There's a pathway from the brain down the spinal column all the way down to lumbosacral plexus to the knee. There's also an energetic pathway. And that all starts in the chest, goes to the, the hands, comes up from the hands to the head, and then from the head goes all the way down you know, towards the knees, and then from the legs it comes back up. So there's flow. And we call these the pathways. Well, we can have total body barriers. And total body barriers can be lines of fascial tension. These lines of fascial tension can be found anywhere. It could be found in your legs. Could be, you know, we're talking about a right knee injury here. It could be in that right knee, but also it could be the left. It could also be in the arms. It could be in the viscera. It could be in the cranial sacral system. We could have problems in the diaphragms. Now. In the diaphragms, they create different cavities, a thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, and we have different pressure gradients. And what's important, we talked about how important it is for blood supply to go to the knee carrying oxygen nutrition. And we also talked about the drainage, the lymphatic and venous drainage. They have to drain from a high to a low pressure. Therefore, this chest cavity has to be an area of greatest negativity. And there's something called Boyle's Law. Boyle's law states when you increase the volume, the pressure decreases. So everybody take a breath in. As you take a breath in, you should feel your chest expand. It expands anterior and laterally, and the diaphragms also will go down and thoracic inlet goes up. So we increase volume, pressure decreases. So it creates a suction. So these transverse diaphragms are so important because they set up these intercavity pressures. We need these. Also, they act as a barrier because the arteries, veins, lymphatics, nerves all have to pass through these structures. So these are total body barriers. Another one you might not think about is the autonomic nervous system. In the middle here is a picture of a, you know, the anatomy of a blood vessel. We have endothelial cells, we have smooth muscle and connective tissue. The smooth muscle is under the control of the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic. So if you're on sympathetic overload, you can get this vasoconstriction. It can affect the drainage. It can affect the circulation to, within, and from, you know, this knee complex. So these are all total body barriers. So the role of manual therapy is to address these barriers. 
either locally or along the pathway. And the role of manual therapy is basically to create a better environment for healing. Uh, A.T. Still, who's the founding father of osteopathy, he said that the rule of the artery is supreme. And this is what he means. He means this inflow, this outflow, this arterial flow, this venous drainage, lymphatic drainage, but also nerve flow. All of this is critical in order for the body to heal. Right. So there's two questions we all ask when a patient comes to see us. The first question is, is where do we treat? Okay. And you might ask, well, do I treat the site of pain or dysfunction? And that's typically where a lot of people go. And it's not your fault. That's how we were trained in school. It's what the insurance companies expect out of us. It's what doctors, because it's more of a Cartesian theory or mechanistic theory. And we call that treating the local lesion. And there's nothing wrong with treating the local lesion. But in order for that area to heal, there have, those pathways have to be intact. So do we need to treat somewhere else? And that somewhere else could be the total body lesion. So James and I are both in agreement that both these pathways and local disruptions are important. We got to evaluate both. Okay, So we have to take a look. And how do we evaluate this? I put something together in the last 30 years, the DAI treatment approach chart, and we'll just review it quickly. I actually spent an hour with this. Um, Danelle brought me in and we did this last year, so she may have a copy of it still. And I know it's on the D'Ambrosio Institute um, Facebook uh, page. Jackie will probably give you uh, a link for it and you can watch uh, how we do this total body screen in this evaluation. So the first question we all always ask is, you know, where do we treat? You know, is it local or total body? The second question we, we always ask ourselves is what do we treat, okay? Do we treat the fascia? Do we treat the muscle? Do we treat the bone, the joint, the suture, right? Do we treat the fluids? But also what about energy? What about emotions? What about beliefs? What about consciousness? So how do we know? And how do we evaluate? Okay? We evaluate with that DAI treatment approach chart and you have the handout on this. Okay, so this is what I use to answer these questions. And this has come from over 30 years of clinical experience, starting out as an athletic trainer, physical therapy, being an osteopath, being a doctor of oriental medicine. And, you know, I've studied a lot with Jean-Pierre Burrell, uh, Upledger, you know, and whoever came by the Upledger Institute uh, teaching there. So hundreds of different mentors. And this approach has kind of lasted the, you know, it's, it's basically survived the test of time working with thousands and thousands of patients that we'll share with you tonight. So the solution to these two questions is something we call the DAI treatment approach chart and specifically the total body screening examination. In this examination, it can be done in as little as five minutes and we look at six things. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I've lectured about this before. And like I said, it is on the DAI uh, Facebook page. You can go there and, and there's, I spend an hour just on this. So we can look at posture and I can um, put my hands on the uh, occipital area and between the occiput and the temporal bones is the jugular foramina where the vagus nerve comes out and that's parasympathetic. I can look at your sacrum and S234 is also parasympathetic. I can put my thumbs down either side of the spinous process where the transverse and the, and the rib meet and I can run my fingers down. And this is where from T1 to L2, where the sympathetics exist. And remember, they affect the smooth muscle of the vasculature, right? They can create that vasoconstriction. I can look at the upper T lines, the shoulder. And if they're not lined up properly, this could be due to lines of fascial tension coming in from the head and neck or the shoulders. I can look at the lower T line. And if this is asymmetrical at the pelvis, this can be due to lines of tension coming in you know, from the legs. So we can look at that. I can then evaluate the lower extremities. I can look at the lower extremities for lines of tension, but also congestion. And I can do the same for the upper extremities. I can do the same for the head and neck. So I'm looking at the legs, the arms, and the head and neck. I can also check out the thorax. I can check out the respiratory diaphragm and thoracic inlet and right around the sternum. Okay. I'm looking for tension. I'm looking for lines of tension. I'm looking for congestion. And then finally, I can look at the abdominal pelvic cavity. I can do an abdominal pump and I can evaluate the pelvic floor. So this whole thing is, again, it's like five minutes to go through. So here we have one guy who has a knee problem, quite athletic. When we put him through the scan, 
you can see the right knee is bothering him. And you would expect to find lines of fascial tension, you know, imbalances in that right leg. You might even see an imbalance in his pelvis, you know, postural skin. But if you notice, there's no problems with, you know, the autonomic nervous system, the occiput's not off, the sacrum's not off, there's nothing wrong in the uh, thoracic spine, the diaphragms are okay. So I would say the pathway of healing is intact. Therefore, I would call this more of a local lesion, where we take a local approach, and we would do more of a local evaluation and a local treatment. And James is going to cover that in the, the second uh, part of tonight to look at that aspect. Now, let's look at this guy. He also has a right knee. And when we did his evaluation, you can see it's very different. He has those lines of fascial tension in that right leg, which you would expect, but all the diaphragms are restricted. The occiput's off, uh, the upper and lower T lines are off, there's imbalances in the sympathetic system, also the sacrum's off. So the autonomic nervous system is affected. It's gonna affect vasoconstriction in the blood vessels. Those diaphragms are going to affect the intercavity pressure. They're also gonna create barriers to the movement of vital substances. So this is a very different animal, right? So this is a total body lesion. We take a total body approach and we can do more of a total body instead of a local evaluation. And we have more of a total body treatment. And in this case tonight, we'll talk about total body balancing, all right? So what is total body balancing? So total body balancing was developed by John Wernham. And he was 99 years old when I met him. And he's an osteopath in Maidstone, England, when I was studying. And he was still treating eight patients a day at that age. And so he developed this total body approach because what he found that a lot of the osteopaths there were treating locally and they were missing things. And he says he wanted to develop a system where he didn't miss anything and to look at how the whole body can be influenced by these lines of tension. So he developed this five-phase program where you evaluate and treat in the supine position, the prone position on the left and the right side and also sitting. And we use these long lever techniques. A lever can be a leg, can be the arm, can be the whole spine in different positions. The whole purpose behind this is, and I'll show you a little video of it, is we want to release these lines of tension in the legs, the arms, and the head and neck. Because if you look at this picture here, right here, you can see that there's fascia on the outside. It's a muscle. You can see the arteries, veins, and lymphatics. But look how they're found deep inside the muscle belly. But there's fascia around it as well. So there's a bunch of lines of tension there that can be affected. So total body balancing releases these lines of tension improve circulation. It also affects the bowstring. And if you think of the shaft of a bow, it kind of represents your spine. The string would represent the organs and the diaphragm uh, systems in the front. So when the organs and the, and the um, diaphragms become restricted, that string becomes restricted and therefore it makes the shaft of the bow very restricted. So one of the things in, in total body balancing is we'd like to treat in supine first. We like to open up this bowstring, release the lines of tension in the legs, the arms, the head, neck, open up this bowstring. By doing so, the whole spine relax. And then when we flip you over your stomach, we begin to uh, work on the spine. And in prone, we can work on, you know, thoracic spine. Side lying is a better position for the lumbar spine. And then we do more touch-ups, more in the seated position. When we do total body balancing, we do it in a very gentle, rhythmic way. And by doing so, we modulate, right? We balance the autonomic nervous system. And by doing so, we affect the smooth muscle. Remember, the smooth muscle is right here at this middle layer. And if you're on sympathetic overload, you get this vasoconstriction, which will affect inflow and outflow. So we want to definitely modulate that to affect circulation because the rule of the artery is supreme. So how does it work? In classical osteopathy, it's very simple. The wedge, the lever, and the screw. The wedge is where you place your hand to do the treatment. That can be, that's your sensory hand. Um, it can be passive or active. The lever can be a, a leg, can be an arm, can be the spine. And the screw is this osteoarticular type rhythmic motion. Okay. So why is this so important? Why is total body balancing important? I'll give you another example. Here's two people with neck problems. And again, their doctors want you to treat their neck, their insurance company, they do. But is this really the problem? 
So if we look at this guy, this is actually a patient of mine. He's six foot four. He's an accountant. And he was just, he's working at a, a small laptop computer. But you can see by his total body screen that everything is very local. And when we did a detailed evaluation, it was his levator, uh, scapula muscles, and protective muscle spasm. We worked with that. We did some joint work, and he was fine. This other woman, she had this problem for 10 years. She'd had a car accident. Um, she had injured her, her left foot, had about four op operations on it. She had a lot of things going on. You can see she had fascial tension in the left leg, the left arm. All the diaphragms were restricted. Autonomic nervous system was restricted. It was interesting that she complained of a lot of you know headaches and neck pain. When she lied on her back, with her leg straight. I tried to move her neck around. I could hardly do it. But as soon as we bent her left knee, as soon as we bent her left elbow, if we go back to this picture, because remember all the tension there, all of a sudden I could move that neck around anywhere. So they weren't really addressing the lines of tension in her body. They were just treating her locally at the neck. And she experienced these problems for over 10 years. And when we started to do the total body balancing with her, it was incredible. We got changes within the first visit. And she's still a patient with uh, mine today, uh, but she is so much better. She comes in mainly for maintenance. So we released those lines of tension in the legs, the arms, the head, and neck. We opened up the diaphragms. We did it in a very gentle, relaxed way to balance the autonomic nervous system. So here's another example, two patients with neck problems. You can see the difference. One is very local. One has a matrix of things going on, lines of tension, the diaphragm the autonomic nervous system. So why do we learn this? Why is it important? It's for those patients that don't respond to what you're trying to do. They go from doctor to doctor, therapist to therapist, they're over-medicated, they may have had failed surgery. These are the people that can benefit from this. You know, I see these every day in my office, okay? Now, when we do the, the total body balancing, it's a five-phase uh, process. I'm just gonna talk about the supine. In super, and I'll show you a quick little video that just shows it, but we want to release lines of tension in the legs, okay? We want to open up the pelvis and begin to open up this bowstring, okay? We want to start to release lines of tension in the arms, right? And into the rib cage. And when we do that, that's opening up that whole bowstring, the viscera, and also the transverse diaphragms. And then we open up the lower arm. Okay, through working the wrist, working with the elbow, and that whole upper arm. So I'm going to show you this video, just about eight minutes, and then we'll be done. So I gently just pick the leg up, just feeling the weight of the leg, just getting an inter, an idea of the, her tension in her legs. Where is she keeping? I can feel a little bit of tension there. There it goes. So everything's all very gentle and slow. There it is. So it's already starting to relax a bit. So this is preparation. That's called the leg vector knee straight. Now we can do with the knee bent. As I'm moving it around, I can evaluate the knee. I can evaluate the hip and the poles into the pelvis. So we're releasing lines of tension at lower leg, but it's influencing the rest of the motions in both directions. Influencing the viscera, the craniosacral barrier. The slower and the softer the movements, the more you're stimulating her parasympathetic system. So this is the leg pump. pump up and down just to loosen up if there's any shear in her iliosacral joint. And this is also a nice pumping maneuver. You can see me working there. She just had a little bit of a click in her foot. Remember, she had some tightness in the foot, so we're just opening that up a little bit. And she also had some tightness in that hip. You can see how the tissues are moving better. It's opening up the ankle, the knee, the hip. So now I'm going to reach across the back. My fingers are going to be the inside of the PSIS. And I'm going to very gently 
work on her right iliosacral joint. Remember she had restrictions in there? Typically we tend to have anterior rotations on the right indominate. That's opening up the pelvic floor. It's doing lymphatic work. Of abduction, flexion, and external rotation. It's opening up the SI joint. If you watch the head, the head's rocking too. This is also affecting the cranial sacral system because the fascia is all interconnected. So that's starting to loosen up. So my bottom hand is the wedge hand, the sensory hand. My other okay, right hand is the motor exactly hand. With the lumbar spine. Remember, this leg is a lever. So wherever I place my left hand, I'm sort of creating a wedge or a focus. I can use this lever and feel the other side as well. So wherever you put that hand, so that's your wedge hand. More posterior. That's your sensory hand. L5, L4. There we go. I like to do a little bit of integration. So you're constantly treating and reevaluating. You can see the legs already starting to move easier. So now we come to the thoracic inlet. And she had a lot of restrictions in here. She wasn't breathing very well. Remember, when you do your evaluation, you want to keep that pattern in your mind because it helps direct your treatment. So this total body balancing is teaching you sort of a, a protocol to go through, but each individual is different where you focus on. The good thing about it is that you don't miss anything. So we're using the long lever of the arm to open up the thoracic inlet all the way across the clavicle. She also had some restrictions in the front of her chest. Working our way down the rib cage in the front. This is working the viscera, now into the respiratory diaphragm. My left hand is the motor hand. So her thoracic inlet seems to be relaxing. So we call it total body balancing because I'm working on the fascia, the muscles, I'm working on the lymphatic system, the energetic system, the nervous system. So here I can work on that clavicle a little bit more. That clavicle is so important because you have the subclavian she nerve really or arteries, veins, lymphatics, and it's the brachial plexus. Chest. Thoracic. So that whole subclavian vein, you know, we have the artery, you have your lymphatic system, brachial plexus, all that can be entrapped by that clavicle if it's stuck. So I can work on that pump handle motion. So this is opening so up that whole thoracic cavity. Her, she was very restricted in that front. So that's gonna help lymphatic drainage, breathing, it's mobilizing all the transverse diaphragms. I can work a little bit of the bucket handle motion. So that's working the side of the ribs it's now. also very restricted there. The patient will feel very relaxed after this because you're affecting the autonomic nervous system. My right hand is the sensory change hand. change my lever. Left hand is motor. 
You want to make sure that you feel a connection between both hands. So the treatment is where my right hand is. Feel this is starting to soften. She really didn't have any tension in her wrists or elbows, so I won't really need to work on that. That's moving better. So you can always go back and, and check things again. This feels a lot better. If I were going to work the the wrist, I do a nice little pendular motion, kind of working a circumduction. I can work all in the radial deviation side to side. We'll just give this a little bit of attention. Breathe in. And out. Uh, nice little stretch there. Good. So we would typically do that on both sides, and then we'd work up in the thoracic inlet region. And then we'd work on the cervical spine, working flexion extension, working side bending, and working rotation. And all that would be phase one. And then we'd stretch the upper fibers of trapezius. So in total body balancing, uh, we have several different layers in, in, in level one, um, TBB1. Jackie's going to send you some information on this. This is sort of teaching you those the full body evaluate, the total body screen, and also the total body evaluation, but also how to treat in, in, in supine and prone sideline left and right in the seated position. Now, in level two, we teach you additional long lever techniques, and the focus in this class is supine and prone. And then in level three, we get more into side lying and seated. You could have some people like if someone's pregnant or someone's in can't lie in a certain position. So you should be able to treat the whole body in supine or prone or side lying or seated. I actually had to treat someone in a standing position. So again, it shows you how you can adapt these techniques, long lever techniques to treat, you know, the spine, you know, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, you know, the, the hip, knee, ankle, foot, et cetera. This is our total body evaluation, and this teaches you um, all the evaluations. We use arts, looking at posture, asymmetry, range of motion, tension tests, and special tests. So this is the whole home study that Jackie will talk about. This is my contact information. I have a new um, uh, email or website, the TSI Clinic. Uh, Therapeutic Systems is my clinic. So we're just remodeling that, tsiclinic.com, and the teaching is D'Ambrosio Institute. We have the Facebook page, um, D'Ambrosio Institute. We have the YouTube channel at D'Ambrosio Institute. That's my email if you have questions. And I'm practicing here in Sarasota, Florida. We do have, if you have questions after tonight, uh, in the Facebook page, we do have Ask Dr. Carey. We can get back to you um, with uh, answers to your question. I usually check that once a week. All right. Thank you very much. And now I want to introduce a very good friend of mine, James Wozlowski, and he's going to uh, focus more on the specifics. So after total body balancing, we've released the lines of tension, we've opened up the diaphragms, we've we basically set up all these pathways of healing, but sometimes patients need a little bit more. They need more of that focused approach. All right, take it away, James. Thanks, Carrie. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um... I'll go ahead and screen share here and pull this one up. We'll share this. We'll go back here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go over just a couple of anatomy things of the knee since we're back to a local knee treatment. Um, I don't really prefer words like runner's knee or jumper's knee or anything because we got to look at all the structures. We got to look at the, the, the femur as, it, as it's supported by the meniscus to the tibia. We've got to look at the ligaments that hold the knee together, the MCL, uh, LCL, ACL, PCL. We've got to look at the alignment of the femur with the tibia so that the patella is not tracking, there's not torsion in the meniscus. So just real quickly, um, I'm gonna the handout I gave you, by the way, was a kinetic chain knee handout. And that's a two-day class. So I'm gonna kind of, in a nutshell, give you uh, 
30 minutes of that. And, and I'm going to highlight the, the real big nuggets of that. So I do know that the knee is often the slave to the hip and the foot. So with the hip, I make sure there's hydration of the hip capsule. I make sure the iliosacral torsions are out. I make sure the iliosacral upslips are addressed. I, I, I check weight bearing foot, but this kind of goes hand in, with, hand in hand with Carrie's total body balancing. So I'm not going to get, get into that in detail today. I do want to talk about scars though, because between a hip replacement scar and another injury that I'm going to talk about, let's go to this one. This was an injury I had uh, uh, in 2020 from a hit and run accident. And the reason I'm sharing this image is, is it caused, it, it's a total body treatment because I not only did I have the wound in my leg, but I also had torsion in my spine, a lot of TMJ stuff, a lot of twisting of my jaw. So one of the things I wanna talk about that I really admired about Kerry D'Ambrose is I took his total body lymphatic drainage course in here in Dallas. And the image on the left is where the bicycle handle went into my leg damaging the femoral artery. The next image to it is when the ER doctor sewed up the leg and made it look really pretty and put a T on there so I could be uh, Mr. T. But you look at all the bruising and the lymph, uh, lymphatic problems in that in that second image. And then the third image, which is amazing, the moment I got home from the ER, I started microcurrent for the scar to treat it at a serial level. And then I also had, luckily I'm trained with Carrie's total body, lymphatic drainage. So I had lymphatic drainage done and microcurrent done daily. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is if you look at image number two and image number three, that's about a seven to 10 day change of, of microcurrent and lymphatic drainage and, and, and it helped to recover completely the damaged femoral nerve was, that was in that general area. So again, I'm, I'm, a lot of times I'll check the subtalar joint, I'll check the mid arch, but that's stuff that would get into a total body or total kinetic chain evaluation. I would, I would look for valgus and varus stress. I do check the positions of the iliums around the sacrum. And again, that's feeding off total body. So let's get into the hip itself. When we get to the hip, one of the things I'm going to look for when Matt gets on my table is in the non-weight bearing position, if someone drives their car, the foot's going to turn out and that's going to, that's going to track the biceps. The biceps morse is going to be a culprit. So one of the things we're going to do when Matt gets on the table is we're going to make sure that there's no rotation of the tibia and fibula relating to the femur by looking at medial or lateral rotation of the foot. And we're going to make sure that we correct misalignment between the femur and the tibia. So if you look at the image on the right, the patellas should be centralized. The medial lateral collateral ligaments should be twisted, should not be twisted. So basically the first thing I look for at the knee itself as an individual knee treatment is, is there any rotation at the knee which is causing torsion in the ligaments and the meniscus and tracking the patella? Um, and we'll do that. Now, the other thing I wanna check is whether your knee is stable enough to perform uh, soft tissue work because an unstable knee, a ruptured ACL, the ruptured PCL, um, the knee stability needs the muscular support. So you do not want to be leasing, releasing quads and hamstrings and gastrocs if you have an unstable joint. Um, so if they've ruptured their ACL, for, say an athlete over pronates and they, the foot immediately rotates, the tibia rotates and the ACL goes out and it's swelling. Again, the swelling, we need the lymphatic drainage work. But what we need to do is we need to evaluate, are the ligaments okay? So I check the ACL with the anterior drawer test. I check the PCL with the posterior drawer test. We'll demonstrate that on mat in a few minutes. I check the medial collateral and lateral collateral ligaments to make sure that the, the knee has the support ligaments hold bones together. So we don't want to, we don't want to loosen up secondary muscle guarding when they're there for protective reasons. So we have to check whether the knee needs stability or mobility. And in this case with Matt, we're going to focus on mobility when we get him on the table. <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to check is I do the athlete compression test in multiple planes. I do it when you're standing. I do it when you're, when you're prone. I'm trying to decide whether the source of pain is the meniscus. You know, it could be bone, it could be ligament, it could be lymph, could be nerves, could be all kinds of things. But I want to know if the meniscus has been injured. I want to perform the aptly distraction test to see when I unload the meniscus, if it's really articular ligamentous referral pain patterns. I want to check for soft tissue lesions, like are the, is there a patellar tendinosis? I want to test the hamstrings for muscle muscle tearing. I want to look at what's going on between the hip, the knee, and the foot that can contribute to distortions and pain at the knee. So I evaluate the muscles that surround the knee, 
the ligaments that support the knee. I evaluate the meniscus and see if there's a lesion in the meniscus that needs to have healthier tissue and balance to support that. <clears throat> I then look at the hamstrings. And when I go down the leg, again, one of the things we'll do in about five minutes when Matt gets on the table is we'll bend the knee to 90 degrees. And if you notice the second image, the foot's turning out. So often, just the way you drive your car, you turn the foot out so the tibia rotates out, the, the, the uh, femur is not lined up with the tibia and the fibula. So that has to be corrected first. Because a lot of times, if I just look at what's going on at the ankle, what's going on at the hip, and I line the tibia up with the femur, that brings everything in the knee itself into balance. So if you have lateral tibial torsion and you don't release biceps femoris and correct that torsion of the knee, you really can't treat anything because they're all kind of twisted. If I take the knee model, which we'll use when Matt's on the table, if I look at when the tibia rotates out, it tracks this patella. It actually irritates the bursa sac. It actually drags into torsion the, the supporting ligament, ligaments. And inside that knee, when there's torsion, there's twisting of the meniscus. So you've got to take that torsion out and line that femur up with the tibia. And really, it's only one technique. Um, I treated a group of chiropractors in Florida who had knee pain, and I just looked at the subtalar joint at the ankle. I looked at the iliums rotating around the sacrum. I looked at the hip capsule. I got rid of tibial torsion. And about 80% of the, the people, once you have a healthy hip, a healthy foot, and a balanced knee, most of that, get, most of the things in the knee heal themselves through balanced functional movement. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to look at any muscle fiber tearing, if there's a hamstring strain, it's just kind of like you don't see the scar, but there's a scar that you have to treat. I do some muscle testing. And if there's a hamstring strain, I want to make sure that the muscles are in their normal resting length. I want to make sure I treat it. And I want to break a little myth about uh, treating scar tissue. I mean, I do it with microcurrent, but also many of my colleagues will use either Graston or Gua Sha or scraping or frictioning to treat the actual scar. And where the scar is at is the, the tools you use, either your fingers with friction or your gua sha or aggression, that doesn't realign scar tissue. It irritates scar tissue. It lays down fibroblasts. It's the eccentric loading of the muscle that follows the frictioning that realigns the scar. So whatever I'm due to treat scar tissue, I follow it with movement, especially eccentric muscle contraction. And it's the organization of fibroblasts are done with eccentric muscle contraction. Um, and Again, you've got to move the limp out of that area where the injury's at. <clears throat> the other thing about IT bands, I don't prefer, um, many years ago, my friend and colleague Eric Dalton shared a study about IT bands and people were doing forearms and elbows and foam rollers. We found that the IT band has the tensile strength of steel. <clears throat> it's not really malleable. It's the most uh, thickened ligament in the human body, if you think about it as a ligament to structure. So if you have a tight IT band and it's affecting lateral knee pain, what I would be doing is loosening up the muscles of the hip, TFL, lateral fibers of glute max, glute medius. I would really do some good pin and stretch of the hip muscles. And then if you look at the second one, rectus femoris, remember the injury in my leg, there was a big hole in there. Underneath there is the femoral nerve. So compressing down on a scarred down nerve or an injured nerve or a nerve that's irritated by improper blood flow and lymph flow is negative outcome. So for IT bands and for rectus fem, <clears throat> I use either massage cupping or techniques that just lift and separate tissue. I lift and separate the rectus fem that unloads its attachment torsion at the ilium that reduces its contributing factor of tension on the patella. And then I, I do cupping, and cupping I mostly use for lifting and separating tissue. It's an antioxidant, it's an anti-inflammatory, it's a neuromodulator. Neuromodul By lifting and separating fascia, um, you get a better outcome for neuro and vascular and lymphatic flow. So I like to do that to enhance lymph, to enhance nerve function. Um, I like to do that for IT bands and for anterior quadriceps. And we'll talk about that when we get mad on the table today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and in the inner thigh, you want to look at things like adductor, sartorius, gracilis, medial hamstrings, loosen all those muscles up. And you want to check again for muscle tearing. If there's an injury, you want to do a muscle test. Where's the scar? Don't go in and just dig on the scar. First of all, release all the fibers that feed the scar. 
uh, again, move the, get the lymphatic system really fully activated, try to lift and separate trapped nerves in there. And so we'll look at some of those patterns. And if you did have a tear again, I want to emphasize this for a second before I get mad on the table. <clears throat> If there's a muscle tear, you've got to balance the muscle groups first to take the load off the either long or short loaded muscle. If there's a muscle tear, you have to do a muscle resistance test to see where the tear is at. If there's a muscle strain or a tear, same thing. You can either do your scraping, gua sha, graston, or frictioning, but a lot of things on social media says the cross fiber friction realigns scar tissue, and that simply is not true. Scar tear it irritates the scar and lays down fibroblasts, just like gua sha or graston or other modalities that we use for scar tissue. But you have to follow with pain free eccentric loading of the muscles. You have to follow with a dynamic force of movement that actually has the ability to do that. And if you treat the scar the, the day of the injury and move the limp and you start to get the blood flow going, these the movement, when I had that injured leg, I, had, I would just gently contract my quads and relax my quads after the lymphatic drainage and after the microcurrent, I would, I would do that in fiber formation in the acute stage of the injury and the proliferation of the scars would be done in the acute stage of the injury. So we have to start, we can't block movement. We can't block lymph flow. Uh, we have to get the body healing and physical healing processes. And then my wife the other day injured her meniscus playing pickleball. That's funny. It's, she just, her knee went into a vulgus stress and, and she injured the MCL and the meniscus. But in order to treat that, we're gonna do what I'm gonna demonstrate here in a few minutes on that. We had to check the hip, check the foot, get rid of the tibial torsion, release all the muscles around the injured area, because to treat those inert structures, you have to actually have all the muscles and joints balanced out. You have to have nutrition, blood, and lymph moving into the area. And you have to then look at those ligaments and meniscus. And what I found with her MCL and her um, medial meniscus is even after I frictioned that and did microcurrent, I went back and repeated the vulgus stress because eccentrically loading the meniscus and the MCL is a way to create a more functional scar around that because we know that scraping and frictioning and so on doesn't reorganize scar tissue. It's the movement that follows or the pain-free balanced functional movement that we achieve through therapy. Um, the last thing I want to do is corrective exercises. You would stretch what's tight. You would strengthen what's weak. And then the last thing I want to say is that my kinetic chain knee DVD that was produced recently is actually 90% more than what I can do in this short introduction talk. And my kinetic chain DVD, we'll just wait one right there, Matt's got it in the background. You can show that for next is 30% is off in this from this workshop. Just enter 30 talk to my website at orthomassage.net. And with that, we're gonna go to the treatment. That was a really quick, almost caffeinated version of an overview. I wanna get you into some techniques. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna get Matt on the table. What happened with that stop share here? Let's go out of here. Let's go back up here. I'm gonna to try to go full screen. So let's stop the share. And now let's see here, what's going on here? Let's get out of this, stop share. Danelle, do I have access to the full screen here? I do see you, James. Um, okay. Yes, and okay. I can see Matt, okay. Okay, let's, let's look, change my view here. Speaker, there we go, view, yeah. all right. All right, so I see you on our full screen, but you can see Matt and I back here? Yes, you're okay, visible. I'm going to bring the camera up just a little bit so we can get Matt. You want to bring the table a little bit closer for me, buddy? And I'm going to move. I'm going to move that. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit. And, so and um, are you working on Matt's? Yeah, I'll be Is working he on, on his Matt. back and left leg. Or okay, we're going to be working on his right knee. So because I'm basically going to do okay, good up with the table. That's good. So basically what we're gonna do when someone comes in with a local, <clears throat> local injury is we're gonna evaluate the knee for stability, basically looking for any instability of the PCL. We're gonna actually check with the interior drawer test. We're gonna draw the tibia anterior and see if there's any extra joint play. 
which will push the tibia posterior for check for joint play in the PCL. And I want to make sure the ligaments are doing their job. So what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to zoom this table over here for a second. Oops, hold on a second. For Matt to be able to see the MCL and the LCL, and I'm just going to move this so you can see his knee a little bit better. For the MCL, I basically look at bogus stress. And for an injured LCL, I put a little load on that for bar stress to see if there's any damage to the LCL. Now, Matt, you can go prone for me, buddy. <clears throat> and I'm going to reposition the table here. We got the Cardone table that I'll be using in Canada next weekend. So it's very mobile. So I'll get you a screenshot of Matt over here so we can see tibial towards the back. So when I bend the knee, you can see that Matt's foot is laterally rotated out like that. So a lot of rotation of the of the tibia. Let's check the right side here. Matt's a lot worse on the right side. So let's give you a side view of this. And I want to explain what this means to me. <clears throat> the first thing I check for knee pain is I bend the knee, I put the ankle at neutral, and the foot's laterally rotated. So one of the first things we're going to do with Matt, and I'm going to get this close so you can see a TM string here. And I'm on a small screen for some reason, but everybody can see the leg on, on the view right there now? Yes, James. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit of the ointment here and treat a muscle called the biceps femoris. So again, the reason I'm doing that is the foot's laterally rotated a lot, which means the tibia and the fibula is rotated, which to the, the viewer means that the patella is laterally tracking. If you don't take out the torsion, you really can't, um, treat a knee problem because everything's twisted. So I'm gonna bring Matt a little bit closer this way. And you're gonna be able to see his lateral hamstring. And basically I'm gonna just do some ma postures release here and work down to the proximal fibular head. And I'm gonna work the long and short head of biceps femoris. So I'm just moving this fascia down, coming down into a lateral glide here. Biceps morse attaches to the proximal fibular head. When I get to the proximal fibular head, I'll decompress the fibular nerve that oftentimes gets trapped in there and try to decompress that. So one of the other things I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna give you a, a front view of this so you can see the correction of that torsion. When I bet Matt's knee, you can see that his foot is rotated out a lot. So Matt, we're going to stretch your biceps morse, buddy. When you turn your foot out towards me, go ahead. That fatigues the biceps morse. Once we do that, I do a little distraction because there's going to be some secondary muscle guarding. I then do a little bit of traction, and then I use the tibia to rotate the fibula and the femur and the uh, tibia and fibula back in. And now Matt's foot is perfectly straight. That improves knee flexion and extension because the femur is now lined up with the tibia. So from there, Matt, we're just going to turn you this way so they can look at the rest of your hamstrings. I'm just going to slide you back over. <clears throat> so work the hamstrings. Basically, we're just going to lift and separate and work towards the knee. And I'm going to get out of the screen here so you guys can see. There we go. So I'm going to lift the hamstrings up off the bone and give a little bit of a broadening to that. I'm just really trying to unload everything between the, the hip and the knee here. And then Matt, you're going to go um, supine, but your head's going to be in the opposite direction for the camera angle. Thanks, buddy. Now I'm going to slow down and talk about the IT band here. The IT band can have the tensile strength of steel and be really tight. I want to encourage therapists not to be doing forearms, elbows, and foam rollers. If the IT band is tight, what I want to encourage you to do instead, I want you to put the, the hip up like this, and we want you to look at the muscles here, TFL, glute max, glute medius, all these tissues in here. And what I want you to do for an IT band that says, I want you to anchor these tissues down to it. So get some blood flow going in there first, just get some blood in there. And then what I'm going to do after I get a little blood flow going in there, is I'm going to pin here, 
And then I'm going to just bring that and Matt, can you straighten everything for me, buddy? Thanks. I'm just going to pin in here and do some pin and stretch here. And I'm going to move Matt this way so we can see that. So I'm just hooking into TFL, move medius, move max, and then stretch with that tissue, get some blood flow going in here. Now, if this was a longer course, once I release the TFL and the move medius and move max and get these muscles nice and softened, what I would do is I would do massage cupping to this. Time permitted, we would do that. But what I'm going to do instead is instead of doing the old school forearm, elbow, and foam roller, I'm just going to try to peel this fascia and this IT band away from vastus lateralis and biceps femoris. And once I peel this tissue away from vastus lateralis and biceps femoris, I'm going to try to free up that IT band. So it's kind of the opposite of what people are doing with forearms, elbows, and foam rollers. And then I do want to reference my... Um, I used to teach sports massage and everything I did was compression, 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 but we've got the femoral nerve that runs between the ilium, between the iliacus and the psoas and along the medial fibers of rectus fem. If you want to reduce the load of rectus fem comes from the ilium, which is here, and it comes down and attaches the patella. If we have patellar tendon pain or an anterior, as, as Carrie talked about, an anteriorly rotated right ilium is common, and that's usually iliacus and rectus fem. So to facilitate better positioning of the ilium, basically I just take this and I, instead of compressing, I lift and separate. I kind of lift and separate right the stem. And what this did with the injury I had in my leg is it freed up the femoral nerve between lymphatic drainage, between microcurrent, between micromotion, which is a gentle lymphatic pump. It helped free up my, my femoral nerve because Sometimes doctors will tell you won't recover because they're not familiar with lymphatic drainage and microcurrent and proper scar tissue work, but I don't compress quads and IT bands, I lift and separate. And then the last thing we're gonna do is for the sake of the camera and for the sake of this being a time thing, I wouldn't normally have my client move up. Matt, can you just flip your head to the other end? I'm just doing this for camera reasons, by the way. And we'll drop that left leg off. So in the inner thigh, we've got things like adductors, sartorius. It's just basically, again, functional separation. Just lift and separate this tissue. Just lift and move tissue. So you've got sartorius in here, semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis, et cetera, all in here. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have, we'll put the leg back up now. I'm going to give you a view from the front here. And the legs are just walking up on that right side. And can you bend your knee for me, Matt? So we look at Matt's foot and it's no longer laterally rotated. So let's say that Matt came in. <clears throat> let's, let's recreate my wife's injury from the other day. Playing pickle, pickleball, friend put a bog of stress in her knee and she tore her MCL and her medial meniscus. So the treatment we did is we just kind of pushed that meniscus back in there because it had slid medial. And then we frictioned the ligament and the meniscus and I'll demonstrate that. So for that demonstration, let's step across the table. So we've got the patella. And then we've got the line of between femur and tibia. We've got the meniscus and friends. Meniscus had slid this way. And the ligament wasn't torn, but it was really overstretched and vulgus loaded. And we're gonna show you how we treated that. So I'm gonna go right between Matt, right? Find his patella, I'm gonna find the patella, and I'm gonna go right around the edges of the meniscus. And Matt, you're gonna be on your calcaneus and you're gonna rotate your tibia back and forth. And as Matt does that, I'm like a sculptor. I just push that meniscus back in. I push it back into the joint space that it had pushed out from in Fran's case. As I push that meniscus back me from that medial shear back into that space, the movement that Matt's creating with the rotation of the tibia brings in blood flow. And it also helps create an, a functional scar around that medial meniscus. And it, it's, think of yourself as a sculptor and you're really just balancing muscles, balancing joints to improve neurovascular functions. And that they rotate, you're just sculpting around that tissue. And then 
we're going to treat as MCL. So the, the MCL is, is injured because the bogus stress test tells me there's a mild lesion or tear in that. When I treat the meniscus, I just do some multi-directional frictioning, but frictioning again does not realign scar tissue. It doesn't realign it in muscles. It doesn't realign it in the ligamentous fibers and doesn't realign it in the meniscus. So one of the techniques I've come up with to create a functional scar to the MCL and the meniscus is repeat the bogus stress test, gently gap the joint and then the functional scar is, is formed and plus things are moved back where they belong. So that lesion right there would be more functional if, if we get Matt so he can have balanced movement. Now we've got deflection, extension and so on. If Matt was my client, he would actually end up stretching biceps more to keep that foot from going back into lateral rotation. And he would strengthen the vastus medialis muscle to support the alignment. The key factor here, we'll have you sit up, buddy. And just uh, because people haven't met Matt while he's sitting up, Matt, you want to say hi to the group? Hey, um, I'm Matthew Moulds. I'm an advanced medical massage and orthopedic and neuromuscular therapist. Uh, I've been working with James for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, I'm the owner of ScarPro. So check me out. Yeah, check it out. Com. And Matt was the uh, lead dancer for the Nutcracker for many yes, years. Yes, Arabian sold for 15 years. So Matt knows, this. Matt knows about injuries. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go ahead to now that was fast and furious, but um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go go back if you want to bring us all back up again. Well, I'm back. And, right. and great. I'm gonna come back in here. Um, the last thing I'm just going to say is that I would never treat personally, I would never treat a knee without hydrating the hip, getting rid of iliosacral torsions or upslips and checking the functional uh, activity of all the bones of the foot, there's 26 of them, and getting rid of things like pronation and supination. But I do wanna thank Carrie, because that injury that I shared with you, thanks to the microcurrent and the lymphatic drainage was miraculously recovered. And I was definitely a full body balancing case. And Carrie did some full body balancing on me recently. And now the whole spinal twisting and the whole kinetic chain, uh, um, I'm very grateful to call him my friend, my colleague, and uh, we're looking forward to doing more workshops together. Well, I'm glad you could start here doing it <laughs> with Edu Talks. Um, both fascinating. Thank you so much. And I um, really, there was one comment from Carol who um, asked about. I'm um, I'm especially interested in how the combination works best with scoliosis. And okay. that was submitted, I think, right when Carrie was finishing and you were beginning, James. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess we'll and, start total body and local body with that. I mean, if it's scoliosis, you have to figure out, is it a true scoliosis? You know, is it is it due to leg length discrepancies? You know, those things can easily be uh, be worked with or muscle imbalances. But if it's a true wedging of the vertebrae, you know, those are a little more difficult. But the key thing is what, you know, functionally, what are they having difficulty with? That's what we're trying to get them back to. So my answer to this all, all the time is I don't treat um, diagnoses. I treat people. So I would do a total body screen on this individual. And if they meet the criteria, for a total body balancing, I would do that first. I would release the lines of tension, you know, in the legs, the arms, the head, neck. I'd open up the, the transverse diaphragms. I would do it in such a way to modulate the autonomic nervous system to improve circulation. I would do all that. But, you know, watching um, James at work, he's a, he's a real magician with what he does. If you start to incorporate now his work very locally at that spot, then you know, you've got an incredible treatment. You want to add to that, James? Yeah, and I think one of the things I look for, having trained in posturology, is that we want to make sure we sort out a functional versus anatomical ligament discrepancies, because sometimes you have to measure the hemipelvis, sometimes you have to measure, sometimes we think it's anatomical, but it's functional and vice versa. My wife had an anatomical ligament discrepancy, which led to sacralization, which led to bulging disc, herniated discs. And had we known that, we could have leveled those hips by putting something in 
one of the legs. But I think the first thing I look for for scoliosis is functional and anatomical. And then I totally agree with everything you just said, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions or comments coming in, except thank you for the presentation. And okay, the person I'm working with now has severe scoliosis. I'm doing mostly local work and care not to interfere with the body's compensation. They care not to? Uh, unless there's a type of typing error, mm -hmm. I care not to interfere with the body's compensation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think like any patient, you have to get an accurate history. You know, what, you know, adding to what James said, is this a structural, is this adaptive? You know, if they had car accidents, if they had surgeries, you know, what kind of sports they play, you got to get full medical history on them, but you want to clear things up. And we don't really just treat scoliosis. What is this causing? Is this causing you pain? Is it limiting range of motion? Is it affecting your strength? So you have to have some kind of outcome you're working um, towards. But I would still, you know, I would assess to see if they meet the criteria for a, a total body. And if they do, that would be my approach until they no longer do that. And then I would, you know, work my way up and down that spine and see specifically I would use ARTS. A is asymmetry, so I'd look for the asymmetry in the spine. R is range of motion. I'd have them do active and passive movement of the thoracic lumbar spine uh, to see where they're limited. I would palpate for tenderness. That would indicate muscle spasm for me. Tissue texture changes, swelling, um, tension tests, more joint involvement, uh, fascial glides, sort of what James was doing. And I would work locally using those different things. And I would, uh, but I would definitely do the total body first. And then I would search and destroy, uh, you know, kind of work on all those different areas. And, you know, your goal is to improve functional mobility, you know, strength and decrease pain and get them back to, you know, things they love to do. So that would um, fall into, Carol had just mentioned, her primary goal with this client is to, um, preventative for future problems. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, and I also think preventative care, you have to look at the kinetic chain, those 26 bones of the foot, if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, when they strike that ground, it's going to work its way into your ankle, knee, hip, back, spine, and neck. And I think if you, you need to watch them in the closed kinetic chain, what's happening when they're walking? Is the tibia immediately rotating? Is the femur causing capsular adhesions? Is it causing an iliosacral torsion? The, 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 is it causing an obliquity and counter-rotation of the lumbar spine? I mean, it, it can be really detailed. In our kinetic chain classes, we really look at that joint interplay and we look at what's happening in ascending patterns that's causing maybe that that functional scoliosis so I think before you can treat the compensations and compensations can be good and bad they can be protective compensations but but a lot of them are negative because the ankle is causing could be causing the scoliosis so if you don't look at the kinetic chain in the compensatory patterns due to an abnormal problem somewhere else in the body, then, then you're just putting a Band-Aid on the scoliosis in my 33 years of experience. I agree with what you're saying. And I always go with global, local, yeah. and then focal. Exactly. You know what he's saying, because you can release the lines of tension. You can restore those pathways of healing. But now when you go back and you do more of a specific evaluation, that's when you start to bring in a lot of your wonderful techniques and say, you know what, we can make this better. We can work on the biomechanics. We can do this and that. And now you've released so much of those global tension that local work you do can, I think, work much quicker. Well, very good. And um, she had mentioned that the scoliosis was from birth. Mm -hmm. but So congenital. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And what I'd like to do is mention to everyone, uh, aside from thanking them and thanking you both, that uh, tonight's presentation has been recorded. Tomorrow, we'll be sending out the recording link. I'll resend out the handout materials that James and Carrie have provided for tonight's Edu Talk. And um, their contact information will also be in the email, so you can contact them directly. And, and Carrie has 2,500 ways you can contact him. But um, I'll include both their contact information in tomorrow's email. 
then within a couple of days, you'll be also getting an email from um, Upledger, from AHI, the International Alliance of Healthcare Educators, will be coming out from Jackie Halderman, and that will include some opportunities and discounts and um, information on Carrie's teachings. Uh, again, I will include the code and the discount that James has provided for his DVDs, and that will also be in the email. So keep an eye on your inbox. And quickly to mention upcoming EduTalks, September 27th, and I think this will be very, very interesting. We have the president of the Massage Therapy Foundation, Adrienne Asta, and she has a call to action here for massage therapists. Engage in research via Massage Therapy Foundation's Massage Net. So that will be September 27th. And um, you can all participate and strengthen the industry. October 11th, we'll have Kelly Lenny, and she will present on Native American inspired self care. October 25th will be Irene Diamond. And she will present on how to attract affluent and appreciative clients while giving back to the community. So that's a look at the rest of this month. Next month, James and Carrie, have I left anything out? Any, We're going to be lecturing closing? next week. We're going to be in Canada next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also, Carrie and I have been talking for a few years about doing a retreat together. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to look at something in 23 where you're getting the non-caffeinated version of my work. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I really think that the more I, I, I like you when you mentioned John Warman, because at 90, some 99 years old, he was still studying. And Carrie and I both believe in that, that we'll probably be like that. We'll still be treating patients. We'll still be students. We'll still be studying. But one of the things I'm seeing is as you integrate leaders of our profession, that's why Carrie and I want to do something together in a retreat together. So be watching for something in that down the road because I, I learned so much when I spend time with this man. So what an honor and a privilege to work together. Count me in, please. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> You're getting great feedback about the retreat. Yeah. So keep us posted. And um, thank you again, both of you so much. I know you have incredibly busy schedules. You're here, there and everywhere. Um, your schedules are found on your websites as well. And I imagine on Facebook, I've, I've seen James, your information on Facebook. So keep an eye out everyone for upcoming opportunities to learn with James and Carrie. And thank you so much. Again, watch your in basket and join us again for future Edu Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danelle. Okay. I'll see you in Canada, Thanks, James. Bye-bye. Right, Travel week. safely. Right. Thanks, bye -bye. Matt. Thanks. Okay, take Thanks, care, Danelle. everyone. Appreciate it, Janelle. Keep it up. Good work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Bye-bye.